Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's episode. Today, I'll be talking with my good friend, Alexa Gilmore, licensed acupuncturist in Portland, Maine, about dermatology and Chinese medicine. Alexa and I go way back, over 20 years, actually. A little shout out to Lincoln Sudbury Regional High School, where Alexa and I both attended. Alexa was two grades younger than me, and even back then, I felt like we were kindred spirits. We had some really unusual things in common in that we both played the cello. We were both thought it would be fun to do things like environmental and social action projects in our spare time, none of which were particularly popular back then. We then both went on to pursue liberal arts degrees, only to turn around and become massage therapists, open body work practices, and then go on to acupuncture school. Alexa received her master's degree in acupuncture and oriental medicine from AOMA Graduate School of Integrative Medicine in Austin, Texas. She is nationally board certified in oriental medicine, which encompasses not only acupuncture, but Chinese herbal medicine as well. And she's a graduate of Mazin al kafajis prestigious Chinese medicine dermatology diploma course in London, England, a distinction that she is the only practitioner in New England to have. And she practices Chinese medicine along with manual therapy at her clinic, ATX Acupuncture in Portland, Maine. And she's got a special interest in pain relief in addition to dermatology. And while she no longer plays the cello, she does sing sacred harp music. Alexa, thanks so much for agreeing to be on the show with me today. Thanks, Brody. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you. So I'm really curious, how did you get interested in dermatology as a subspecialty? In some ways, I hate to say that it was a fluke, but it was a little bit. Back uh-huh. when I was in Chinese medicine school, a good friend of mine had been to one of Mazen al kafajis seminars when he'd come here um, to the States and was really taken with his teaching style, was really taken with his efficacy. The great thing about treating dermatology is it's very clear when things are improving and when they're not. So his before and after. You can see it on the person's face. face. Exactly. Exactly. Um, It's very rewarding that way. So she was really impressed with him as a teacher and kind of before we even had finished school, threw it out there. Why don't we go to London and study with him? And I thought she was crazy at first because why would I immediately after school take off and go back and forth to London to study? But the more that I looked into his teaching style and got familiar with that. And the more that I thought about it, it began to make sense, partly because I realized as I was contemplating, I had struggled with skin a lot. And wouldn't it be nice to have some more solutions than I had been able to find up until that point? So it seems like if that were a direction I were going to go in, I would have you know, some sense of empathy with my patients having gone through you know, acne later in life than I felt like I should have had it sometimes relatively severe and also kind of a chronic skin condition on the tips of my fingers for a period of time when I was in Chinese medicine school, and then just sort of dove into it, and and it took off from there. Awesome. So you basically followed your love of learning and (laughs) and a condition that, that you had some personal experience with, but really just wanted to help your patients and were when we're inspired by this particular teacher? Yeah, yeah, inspired by him. And I think During my time in school, I didn't have, I had a lot of really fantastic teachers, but not a particular mentor. So there was something for me about leaving school and finding a a mentor that was very appealing as well. And Mazen has certainly been that in lots of ways. Awesome. So I'm curious, what kind of conditions can you treat with Chinese medicine for skin? Acne, psoriasis, all kinds of eczemas. So general dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis. There's a kind of eczema called pomphalic eczema that happens on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Vitiligo to a certain degree, so that condition where you lose the pigment in your skin. Lichen planus, fungal infections, bacterial infections. I just had a fantastic case of impetigo, so a bacterial infection on the face of this particular person that just got very severe very quickly, and we intercepted that within a couple of days with Chinese herbs and shouldn't have to go on antibiotics. Um, a couple of days, that's awesome. A couple of days, yeah, yeah. I think that 
a lot of our listeners out there may have heard of acupuncture for things like arthritis or back pain or fertility or stress relief, but probably not very many people think of Chinese medicine as a great option for skin. And I'm curious, is there a way that you could explain to our listeners how this works? <laughs> like, first of all, where do you put the needles? Yeah, well, sure. And nor would I. And actually, the, the first thing I tell patients is when I treat for skin, for the most part, needles are actually secondary. So it's primarily an herbal intervention. Depending on the nature of the skin disease, the degree to which somebody's stress or anxiety might be playing into a flare of the condition, in those cases, I might want to do more needling. But mostly, it's a really strong herbal intervention. So one of the things I think that Chinese herbs do really well for skin disease is we have a very complex way of understanding inflammation in the body and how it presents itself. So as a, so all of these skin diseases that I see, acne, psoriasis, eczema, often have an element of inflammation in them. But using Chinese medicine physiology, I can assess where in the body that inflammation is in a much more sophisticated way than I think a lot of Western medicine has to offer. So with everyone that comes in, I'm looking very specifically at their lesion itself. So just because someone comes in with psoriasis, doesn't mean that there is a Chinese formula for psoriasis that I'm going to give them. It matters to me. Is it psoriasis on your scalp? Is it psoriasis on your elbows and knees? Is it mostly on the lower part of your body? Is it a really damp lesion? Is it weeping or is there exudate? If there is exudate, what color is it? Is it clear? Is it thick? Is it yellow? For things like eczema, I might ask if how itchy it is. Psoriasis too, but for eczema, how itchy is it? Is it worse at night? Does it bleed easily when you scratch it? And then the color of the lesions themselves. So psoriasis, eczema, acne, the colors of those lesions can go anywhere from being dark, dark purple to almost brown through all your ranges of red to being kind of a bright scarlet red. Or in some cases, lesions that have been around a long time can be very pale and almost seem like they don't have a lot of what we would think about as sort of a red inflammation to them. All of that gives me very good, very specific information about how to treat each individual patient's particular eczema. That's a really great description, I think, of the fact that in Chinese medicine, we're really interested in treating individual people rather than conditions, right? Like that you're yeah. much more interested in where it is and how it's showing up for a given person as opposed to kind of that oh, everyone with eczema gets the same formula because it really right. does. It's like we that's our job as practitioners is to strip off the labels and look at at the, the underlying cause. So that's fantastic that you can really tailor it to what a person has going on. Exactly. And that being said, also bearing in mind that all of these diseases have been identified as individual diseases in the context of Chinese medicine for hundreds of years, most of them. So psoriasis, I can't tell you the Chinese, but psoriasis does have a name in Chinese. Eczema does have a name in Chinese. I think mm -hmm. acne even has a name in Chinese. Yeah. We've identified them as specific disease processes. And there are certain herbs that I'm almost always going to include in an eczema prescription that I may or may not ever include in a psoriasis prescription because we know that those herbs are very specifically good for that condition. And then on top of that, I might have a case of eczema and a case of psoriasis that get almost the same rest of the formula because they're presenting heat in the same way that I've talked about. You know, they've got heat in a particular level of their body. They've got they're, they both have weeping lesions. You know, there's things about them that are similar so that their pattern is similar, even though the disease itself is different. And that formula might be more similar than two cases that we've diagnosed as eczema because a case of eczema that's on the lower legs and somebody has edema or swelling and the lesions are oozing, that's a whole different kind of eczema than somebody who has a patch on the inside of their elbow and their upper body. Yeah, this really speaks to the concept that the same underlying condition can give rise to different patterns in mm -hmm. the body and that we're looking at, at what's going on in the system as a whole. So likely, I'm, I'm sure you ask questions not just about the skin, mm -hmm. but about all the different systems of the body. Is that right? Yeah, of course. Really good point. Yeah. So I want to know about how people make fun of me because I talk about poop all the time, but it's so important. So I want to know how are your bowels moving? Somebody who is constipated versus somebody who's got really loose bowels, that tells me something potentially in the context of the person as a whole, right? And all of their other signs and symptoms. Bowels being constipated versus being loose are two very different things. Similarly for women, I want to know a lot about their menstrual cycle, how their menses is going, how long it is, especially the movement of blood, the color of blood, how painful it might be. All of those things can be really important for me in my diagnostics. How they're sleeping, 
how their mood is. So there are certain, and I alluded to it before, but there are certain skin conditions where anxiety and underlying stress really are, are very provocative in terms of symptoms. And so knowing the degree to which that in Chinese medicine, we might call it a shen disturbance is, is a part of the picture is really helpful too. Some folks might have eczema, but they're not hot and agitated at night and they're, they're, they don't really seem to have anxiety as part of that. That's going to be a different formula, again, from someone who's having trouble falling asleep, they're restless at night, they're very upset and nervous about their eczema. It's really, it's mentally upsetting to them. That I take into consideration in terms of the formula. What percentage of cases that you treat have to do with stress? <laughs> I think everything has to do with stress. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Though? And it is such yeah. our lot in life as acupuncturists to yeah. ask the embarrassing <laughs> questions about poop and about yeah. the menses and all the stuff that people don't people want to talk about. To but it really... Stress. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> start to whisper and it's like no no this is the sixth time I've talked about bowel movements today I promise you exactly you cannot shock us and 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 in (laughs) fact actually the more details that we get the more the picture becomes clear in terms of what the diagnosis is and so when I was in Chinese medical school I learned you know I'm certainly not an expert in dermatology but what I did learn about skin stuff is that it's most often a combination of heat Mm. dampness or something going on with the blood like the blood isn't sufficient or the blood is too hot too damp something so would you agree with that assessment I mean is that in terms of yeah so so yes often we're most of what I'm doing with skin disease is clearing heat and I'm clearing heat in different ways depending on depending again on how it's presenting so Uh, just to clarify when you say heat what do we mean by that in Chinese medicine what might that look like? So, yeah. well, for one, we have all these diagnostic tools in Chinese medicine in general. When it comes to skin, I'm actually using the lesion itself diagnostically. Mm-hmm. So okay. the, literally the level of redness in the lesion implies heat. If there's an exudate, if it's oozing at all, the more yellow or the more thickened it would be implies heat, um, that there's heat in the system, specifically toxic heat. If somebody, let's say somebody has bowel movements, they could either be constipated and their bowel movements are really dry. So that might be a dryness due to heat. It could be a dryness due to other things. So again, it's always about the constellation of symptoms, but I might start thinking, is there heat in this person's body? Really strong thirst. Their tongue might be very red. Oh, so you're looking at what might be the cause of this heat if, if heat is indeed the main problem and whether that heat is combined with dampness or, or not. And, and you're mm-hmm. looking at the lesion itself uh, for information about that. Fascinating. So different than, than going to a Western dermatologist where they're, they're just going to basically be interested in knowing the nature of the skin condition and not really much else. Yeah. So you're actually and going I- into a lot more specific depth. Yeah, and that's what's unfortunate. And one of the reasons that I love treating skin so much now, despite the fact that it's so rewarding, is that for so many people with really difficult recalcitrant conditions, they run the gamut with all the Western interventions, and which typically are steroids, and then more steroids, and then more steroids, and then stronger steroids. And then often I have people coming to me after they've been, it's been suggested they go on immunosuppressants, which is not something to be taken lightly. Right. Um, it seems rare to me, it's rare so far to me that I found a dermatologist who's sort of exploring other options. So most people haven't even had even more general alternative medicine options, like general food recommendations, which is another thing that we could talk about if you're interested, you know, the sort of oh, general I mean, basic food recommendations for skin. Lots of absolutely. people haven't, haven't even gone there. So yeah, what are your basic recommendations for what could people do dietarily if they want better skin? Yeah, so I... Two-part answer. One is that it's different. Well, three-part answer. <laughs> it's no problem. It's different depending, depending on the skin disease itself. Again, there's no across-the-board rules and regulations. It's different depending on the constitution of the person. So there, there, are, there are a few things I will say across the board about food, namely that we should all be eating real food, right? Like not processed food, limiting our sugar intake, limiting preservatives, things like that. That's sort of like the only general recommendation that I'll make. Beyond that, as I, as I think you would agree, it's all about the specific person that comes in that is in front of us, regardless of why they're coming to see us. We make recommendations so, specific to that person. 
So if somebody's got heat, like which we've been talking about, so like the lesion is red, there's a lot of yellow exudate, maybe their face is red, maybe they overheat easily, maybe they're mm-hmm. constipated, maybe they have difficulty sleeping, they have rage, they have, you know, various <laughs> forms of heat in the body. Yeah. What could what do you usually recommend that people stay away from dietarily or add to their diet to treat heat? Yeah. Well, let's just let's just add, since we're talking skin, let's say that that person's come in because they have acne. Great. Okay. So, Great so yeah. So, so all of those things apply really well to somebody with acne, and they've got maybe some deep cystic acne on their face. Maybe it's on their upper back. Perhaps this is a teenager. Maybe a teenage boy. They tend to have more of this stuff. It's really pussy. So for acne, I across the board want people to cut out sugar. So really limiting your refined sugar intake, and even looking beyond that, depending on how good your diet is to start with, we might even be looking at how much fruit you're eating, but just processed sugar in general uh, as number one. For a lot of people, that's going to be the bulk of the sugar in their (laughs) diet is from things in boxes. Yes, exactly. And Um, refined sweeteners. Yeah. And then the second important one for me when it comes to acne is looking at fat. And I am in no ways anti-fat. I think actually in our culture, we're afraid of fat and most of us need to be eating more of it. Fat is really important in terms of having good quality to our blood, but it's about the quality of the fats. And so it's about removing vegetable oil. So all the fats we've kind of been sold are particularly good for us that we're learning aren't so much. So sunflower oil, safflower oil, canola oil, all of those oils that you might cook with that are mostly in processed foods. They're in your chips, your boxed crackers, your cookies, your baking with them. And we use them a lot because they're handy because they're a fat that doesn't have any flavor or odor. But um, that comes at a price, which is that they tend to generate inflammation in the body. I love that you're bringing this up because that recommendation is not only great for the skin, it Mm -hmm. is great for the arteries, the cardiovascular system, the liver that really just uh, that cutting out the bad fat in the form yeah. of the vegetable oils, it, the industrial seed oils, I would include like, you know, soybean yeah. oil and, and, the, and anything, obviously anything hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated is, is yeah. bad stuff for the body. And the skin, right, is an organ of detoxification. So mm-hmm. it's it's a pathway out for the stuff that our bodies go, what do I do with this? Right. It's like, yeah. you know, d- does a soybean naturally have a bunch of oil? Like not really. So it, Mm-hmm. So really that getting rid of getting rid of the processed food, getting rid of the bad fat. And what do you consider good fat? What should people be having instead? So I don't think butter is bad depending on the – you want to make sure it's really well-sourced butter. But butter and ghee coming from, you know, happy pastured cows, if we can, if we can manage yep, that. Yep. Avocados, coconut oil, you know, nuts, not in the kinds of quantities that people often eat them these days. Um, and that's another thing in terms of – in terms of people looking at their fats in a presentation like you talked about, the quality of the nuts and how fresh they are. So rancid nuts can be a problem. Lots of people coming in who have generally healthy diets, but they're eating nuts in a large quantity and nuts that have gone bad or nuts that have been roasted in peanut oil. And all of these things can tend to cause pustular breakouts of the skin specifically on the face. Dairy is another one. I'm not necessarily against dairy across the board. Like any animal product, I think it's really important to look at sourcing and make sure that we're getting the most organic pasture product we possibly can get our hands on or that we can afford. But when people are struggling with this particular kind of, and it's specifically pustular acne, not other kinds of acne, dairy can be a problem. Sometimes people do great on raw milk, but they don't do great on regular milk. And I would argue that those are, it's because they're two very different things. The m- yes. most milk that we write that we buy in the store versus actual raw milk that's unadulterated from an actual cow. And so cheeses, I have people with, again, with this pustular acne where soft cheeses can cause problems, specifically sometimes mozzarella especially, whereas hard cheeses are okay. And so we talk through some of the details of this with people, and it depends on how conscious they are of their eating already. I try not to overwhelm people with recommendations meeting people where they're at, understanding where the biggest problem might be and starting there. Um, Absolutely. Looking for that low-hanging fruit. (laughs) That is so key. Great way to put it. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And for for listeners who might have checked out the Body as Ecosystem episode, I believe we talk about dampness a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so like a lot of what you're saying, you know, kind of that like turbid oil and 
and refined sugar and dairy products that have been messed with and homogenized in, in these in these kind of weird ways, they become something that the body doesn't quite know what to do with. And so it lingers, it hangs out, and then it goes up into the skin where as the body attempts to release it. And, and that, yeah. like you're saying, like that kind of anything that, that has kind of a wetness to it or has a pustular or cystic kind of aspect to it right. can show the, the more damp side of things. And so really, like, would you say that, like, as people learn to digest better, that their skin gets better? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I also want to caution, this came up this week with somebody in my office. I feel like in some ways, with people who come to see folks like you and I, the pendulum has swung the other way, where they've rejected this idea of the body as They've embraced mind body. Let's put it that way. They come to uh-huh. us because they've somewhat embraced mind body, but in embracing mind body, they've rejected the body. And so they feel like they should, whether it's through their mind and processing their emotions or whether, even though it's not quite mind, it's partly body, whether it's through, you know, eating really well, um, thinking that they're taking care of themselves in every possible way, people still, sometimes their body still needs help. So even though I have a lot of people who come to me and they've cleaned up their diet and they've done such a good job, but it's Mm -hmm. like for whatever reason, their body has swung so far past balance that the lifestyle and dietary interventions alone just aren't strong enough to get them back into balance. So I always encourage them to keep up with those interventions. Everything they're doing is great. Here's a couple more ideas. And you didn't fail for having to ask for help. Because Absolutely. your body needs some support. And then once you're in balance, all of these things that you're doing are going to help you stay in balance, which is fantastic and what we want ultimately. A couple of folks who had to go in and actually get steroids for their skin who just were almost weeping in my office because they felt like they had failed. And I think That's it's so hard to see when people yeah. are blaming themselves because, yeah, we all need support sometimes. And drugs mm-hmm. can be a, a way of getting through a hard patch. And Chinese yeah. herbs can be another way or acupuncture can be another way of getting through a hard patch. And it doesn't it's not a moral failing by any exactly. means. It's yeah. Another thing, that, as you were talking about damp in the events, I don't know how I haven't listened to your Body Ecology, was that what it was, podcast? Now I have to go listen uh, to it. Episode four, the body. Episode as four. <laughs> I'll go listen to that. <laughs> but maybe y'all talked about this, but one analogy that may help your listeners that was really helpful for me when I was in school in terms of understanding damp and just how cloying it is and how it mucks things up in the body is to imagine if you have a freshly mown lawn. Mm-hmm. And so all the grass clippings are sitting on top of the lawn and it's a beautiful, dry summer day. And you go skipping through the lawn because you've got... It's Friday afternoon and you're off work. And, um, you know, you get a grass clipping here or there on your foot, but you just brush it off and it's gone, right? You, you're able to, like, move through those fresh glass, grass clippings and they don't stick to you. So next morning, you have a great night, a Friday night. You wake up the next morning. You go out. Let's say you walk across the lawn to collect your newspaper. And now it's kind of a foggy, dewy, damp morning. And those grass clippings are still sitting on top of your lawn and you're shuffling through them in your bare feet. Now, we've all been there. You walk back to your house and your feet are covered in little bits and pieces of grass. How hard is it to get that grass off your feet compared to the grass when you were skipping through the lawn the day before? So that's kind of the mechanism of damp in the body, how it just, it's sticky. It's tricky to get rid of. Yeah, it gloms things up. And so everything we can do to not be adding that to our system is helping us in the long term. Yeah. And that's not only that, that I think I love that. I love that. I've Mm -hmm. actually never heard that particular analogy before. And I think it's great. And that's like typically the the biggest ways that we get dampness in the body, that aforementioned dietary stuff, but also things like guilt and emotions Mm -hmm. and thought patterns that we can't get rid of, that things Mm -hmm. that are, that are cloying and stick around. And and Mm -hmm. that, so that, that kind of like inventory of what don't I actually need anymore that I need to detoxify from that is lingering and heavy and holds me back. Yeah. All that that damn yeah. stuff. I'm wondering uh, for people out there who maybe don't have chronic skin issues or the kind of uh, dermatological problem that would have them seek out help from someone like you, but maybe so just someone who wants to keep their skin healthy as they age. Do you have any any advice just for everyone out there in terms of keeping their skin looking and looking youthful and feeling fresh? I think it's things probably people have already heard. So I mean obviously Staying hydrated, which does not mean forcing water. If you mm-hmm. if 
if you're not thirsty, talk to somebody who understands about water metabolism and see why you're not thirsty, but staying hydrated. Dry skin brushing, if you haven't talked about that in your episodes, can be really good to just improve circulation to your skin. So that is an Ayurvedic intervention that people can, or Ayurvedic self-care people can do daily. Um, and super so, inexpensive. We actually haven't talked about this yet on the show. Mm-hmm. So if you want to explain that really quickly, go for it. So dry skin brushing, it's it's basically a, it's a stiff bristled brush. And every morning you can Start at your fingertips and start at your toe tips and brush upward leading towards your heart. You may know about this specifically more than I do, Brody, but it's it's stimulating your lymphatic system, so lymphatic return, stimulating all your nerve endings, sloughing off dry, dead skin cells so that your surface skin stays fresh and turns over well, and it also just feels really good. Wakes up your whole body. It's a really fantastic way to start a day. All right, so hydration and dry brushing in Mm -hmm. general. Anything Um, else? A great balanced diet, really good sleep, generally taking care of yourself and managing stress. All that good stuff. All that good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, but I'm try- I, that's actually a really good question, Brody. I wish that I had more, because people ask me that, and I feel like I'm, I have a lot to offer people when they've got a problem, but I wish yeah. that I had more specifically Chinese medicine. Here's how to maintain your skin. I don't know if you have any ideas on that front, but... You know, Abhyanga is a a practice Mm -hmm. that I recommend to people. And um, but also like just thinking about the good yin, you know, Mm -hmm. which I think we've already talked about with the good fat stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Those are that's the basic. I mean, it's mostly just taking care of yourself. And then we can talk about what that means in the context of Chinese medicine. All of those are really great tips that I think we can all implement. So, Alexa, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today about dermatology from a Chinese medicine perspective. If people wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do that? Thanks, Brody. It's been so fun to be here. Uh, People can find me. I have a website. So it's atxacu.com, and they can find me through that site. There's lots more information. So if this has piqued anybody's interest and they want to read up a little bit more on my approach to treating skin, it's chock full of, of info. So they can reach out to me that way or just educate themselves a little further. Awesome. There's also oh, really great before and after pictures, which are my favorite when I go to people. I just love before and afters. I've always loved makeovers. So um, okay. there's some of those on the site as well. People are interested in seeing what Chinese medicine yeah. do. Yeah. I was just on your site earlier today, and yeah, there are some really impressive before and after pictures, which are really inspiring. So I hope that if you're out there struggling with a skin issue, that know that Chinese medicine could potentially offer you hope and a solution. And Brody, let people know too that. If they hear this and don't know who to go to, have them reach out to me because I'm really well connected to a lot of the people who do specialize in skin. So I, I might be able to find somebody close to them who could take good care of them. Excellent. Excellent. And a lot of, you know, acupuncturists who mm-hmm. are certified in Chinese herbs often have a lot of this training too, but certainly not to the degree that, that someone who's gone on to do some advanced study is in. So that's a great resource to put out there. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Brody. Thanks again. Great to talk to you. You too. Bye-bye. This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by The Basics of Chinese Medicine, a unique eight-week deep dive course to help you understand your inner ecosystem and start to make more medicinal choices in your daily life. To reserve your spot for the fall, visit BrodyWelch.com and click the Learn From Home tab. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to BrodyWelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.